Welcome everyone to the North Carolina Botanical Gardens Virtual Lunchbox Talk Program and our last of these talks for 2020. I'm Joanna Massey Lalikas and I oversee the education department here at the North Carolina Botanical Garden. Thank you all for joining us virtually on this cold, nearly winter day. Today, through our partnership with the New Hope Audubon Society, we are bringing you Curtis Smalling. We'll be talking about actions we can take to improve outcomes of many bird species that are currently on the brink. Curtis Smalling is the Director of Conservation at Audubon, North Carolina. He was raised outside of Boone and is a lifelong birder and oversees all of Audubon's conservation programs in North Carolina. We're so excited to have him here with us today. What an honor. His work really touches on all sides of bird conservation from habitat restoration and management to migratory bird research. He's been a primary research for species like the golden winged warbler and the yellow bellied sapsucker and is especially interested in how landscape level conditions affect bird populations. So Curtis, thank you so much for joining us and I'll hand it off to you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Joanna and Lauren, uh, for hosting me today. And, and thank everybody for um, taking the time to spend your lunch with me today. Um, I do want to um, get my slides up here. And um, of course, as we <laughs> weather affects us all, right? Today, we're going to be talking about climate, which is slightly different. Um, but we want to, to think about um, some ways that climate change or climate variability might affect birds. And, and it's based on um, a big report that Audubon nationally produced uh, last year called Survival by Degrees, uh, 389 bird species on the brink. Um, um, throughout today's presentation, we're going to have a, a couple more polls. I'm also going to share some links to some deeper reading for you on, on this topic. Um, Lauren, if you want to put up our first poll question, I won't spend a lot of time analyzing your results, folks, but um, I do want to pose a few questions as we go along today, um, just to kind of see where everybody's at. Uh, um, so this is, have you seen changes that you believe are related to climate change in, in just in your own neighborhood? And it can be everything from changes to the birds you're seeing, to the phenology of the plants you see, um, weather, any other thing that you feel like um, can be attributed to climate change. You know, a lot of the variability that we see often is kind of interannual variation. It may not be due to, to large changes in climate, but, but a lot of folks, and I see our poll is uh, pushing up toward 90% of folks are, are feeling like they're seeing things that seem different or look different than what they've experienced in the past. Um, we'll dig into to some of that. So. Um, there we go. So about 90%. Um, and that tracks pretty well with kind of national polling. Uh, a lot of folks feel like they're seeing new things uh, at play in their, uh, in their communities. So I want to talk today kind of in three buckets. We're going to talk about the big survival by degrees report, um, take a little break and, and answer some questions on the national study, then take a deeper dive on what that study means for birds in North Carolina. Um, and then the third part is kind of what, what can we do about it, <laughs> right? Um, I think uh, um, climate change uh, often requires big solutions and often we forget that there are kind of daily decisions that can also impact our success or failure in the face of climate change. So let's talk a little bit about um, survival by degrees. I can get my, there we go. Um, so in the fall of 2019, the national science team at Audubon released a, an update of a original study that came out about four or five years earlier that looked at how climate is expected to affect birds. The new report, the survival by degrees report, uh, made several improvements to the first one. The first was that the, the amount of data that was used was massive. Um, we also included some threats that are related to climate change. Often we talk about climate change uh, in, in, in the singular, right? But typically what happens is climate change creates individual types of threats, whether that's drought or storms or uh, increased rainfall at 
odd times of year, th those kinds of things. So, so looking at those threats, and of course those threats had to be threats that could be mapped, right? Like how, how is that changing across the landscape? And then also the, the, the new report really takes into account some of the um, more analysis that was done on what we already know has happened with birds. Many of you may have seen the, the 3 billion birds report as it's called that came out of Cornell about the same time as the, as the survival by degrees. And it really shows that even over the last 40, 50 years, we've had some pretty amazing changes in the way birds are distributed, how many there are, what some of the causes for that may be. Some of those, are, of course, are, are um, you know, directly related to things like habitat loss and other things that are just um, uh, maybe not related to climate change. But a, but a fair number of those birds have had changes in distribution, shifts north, shifts south, all those kinds of factors as well. Um, so let's talk about the data just a little bit that went into the study. It was over 140 million individual observations of birds. And these came from a wide variety of sources, including eBird and uh, the Breeding Bird Survey, Breeding Bird Atlases, a, a number of number of efforts. And, and the reason to assemble such a large data set was basically to assign a climate address, if you will, to an individual bird species. So we looked at about 20 um, climatological factors like average annual rainfall, uh, minimum nighttime temperature, maximum daily temperature, just a, a wide variety of, of um, meteorological data and compared the location of these reference, geospatially referenced bird records. And out of that comes basically a, a climate address. What, where do birds live and how does that affect their distribution? Um, We'll post some, some links along the way in the chat um, that link to the scientific papers, some FAQs for the national study if you want to, to dig a little bit deeper and see all of the variables that were included in the study. Um, there were a few other things that were added this time. The original climate report in 2015 just looked at the climate address, but the new report also takes into account kind of current human land use condition across the um, kind of the North American continent. Also, what major vegetation types uh, dominate in those parts of the, of the world. And also um, for species that are intimately tied to water, we also put them in closer proximity to the needs they have. Like for instance, a coastal bird, like a black skimmer. Um, so adding that global surface water layer in there as well tended to tighten up the predictions. So survival by degrees, the, the, the projections then to project that forward, that climate address forward in time, if you will, to see where birds might move to or change or lose habitat based on that climate trajectory, used a number of different projections um, and, and basically aggregated those, um, but over three basic scenarios. One is this kind of 1.5 degree increase, 1.5 degrees Celsius, um, increase that was the agreed upon ceiling, if you will, of, or target of the Paris Accord. Um, we also evaluated um, climate based on a two degree model, a two degree increase and a three degree increase. Now, a lot of folks feel like our current policies are gonna put us on a path toward three degrees or higher. Um, and so the, the survival by degrees projected these bird distributions by species at these different scenarios. And the results that you see presented on the website that we'll talk about later, really compare the one and a half degree changes to the three degree changes. Um, all of those, of course, projected off of current conditions. So what does that kind of look like? What is, what is a map, if you will, of, of a species? How, how, do those things, how do those things play into um, the outputs or the maps that are projected. And then these maps are used then to rank or score a species as highly vulnerable, um, vulnerable to climate change, stable, those kinds of things. So we look at a wood thrush as an example, the current range that used those 140 million data points of bird data um, came up with a, a range that you see in the kind of on the far left, um, a one and a half degree climate address and land use scenario and all those other layers that are in this analysis. Now you see the middle map is at one and a half degrees of increase. 
on almost all these maps that I'm going to show you today, and I, and I won't overwhelm you with a lot of complicated maps, but the, the red color is, is range loss. The blue is potential range gain, almost always at the northern end of a species range. And we'll talk about why that is in a little bit. Um, and then the colors in between uh, are various um, gradations of those extremes. You can see the difference though between one and a half degree scenario and a three degree scenario for wood thrush. Uh, we're gonna talk about what that means and kind of the take home message of that, which is actually a message that's fairly hopeful. And I hope when we end today, you'll see that there, there is hope in this analysis and, and hope in the things that we can do uh, to impact it. Now, one of the things, one of the first things that the science team did then was look at species groups by basic habitat. So whether it's Arctic breeding species or boreal forests or Western forests or um, grassland species and, and how did those species as a group do? And what we find is that the, um, at least the way that, that these are split, um, the, the four most vulnerable groups are Arctic species, boreal forest, Western forest, and water birds. Um, I, I'm particularly interested in forest, and if you combine all the forest types, then forest birds are particularly vulnerable to climate change. Part of that is that we have a lot of forest in our, in our continent, <laughs> and so they, are, they show up a lot more because we have a lot more species that are forest-based. Um, but even though you see descriptors like boreal forest, we have a number of bird species that, that live, nest, migrate through North Carolina that are considered boreal forest nesters. Uh, a lot of our high elevation breeders, for instance, are, are considered boreal forest birds. So when you see boreal forest, often we think Canada, but um, the way these species are grouped, some of those uh, do occur here in North Carolina. So if we aggregate um, all of the 600 plus species that were analyzed and we look at just loss of species in a particular location and gain of species in a particular location. The summary slides are here and you can see the pattern is similar, but the intensity is different. So we do see a gain in net species as you move north um, and we see uh, kind of losses, especially right along the, the boreal shield as it's called, this kind of right up against the boreal forest and within the boreal forest. Um, but a lot of other places you'll see uh, the High Plains, um, New England, um, actually the, the kind of breadbasket, the, the upper Midwest uh, have pretty high losses of species. Um, and then of course, a lot of potential gains the farther north you go in kind of advance of temperature rises. Of course, we all know that the, the habitat has to change to support birds that are habitat specialists. And so this really just looks at climate availability or suitability. The second piece of the um, report really dug into what kinds of climate related threats um, directly affect birds and can affect their productivity and their survival and their distribution. And so the, there are nine basic um, mappable um, climate related threats. And those would be sea level rise and the associated Great Lakes level changes. Urbanization, which we often don't think of as a, as a climate related um, threat, but what, what is being um, studied and proposed by folks who study things like agriculture worldwide and others is that as these other threats affect agriculture or forests or other things, there's gonna be a continued migration to cities um, as it becomes more and more difficult to uh, kind of eke out a living um, especially in underdeveloped countries uh, out in the, in the undeveloped parts of their countries. And so in Central America, for instance, or Mexico, we may see continued um, uh, kind of retreat to the urban centers, uh, which puts further pressure from urbanization. But everything from cropland expansion uh, in certain places where rainfall patterns will change to um, weather events like heavy rains or droughts or fire weather, which is high winds, dry, especially dry in the parts of the year that are normally wet, those kinds of threats. So if we look at those threats across the US, 98% of the US is gonna be affected by one or more of those climate related threats under a three degree warming scenario. You can see it again, the pattern is similar, but the intensity gets worse um, if we go from one and a half to a three degree. 
The good news is if we stay at the kind of Paris Accord level, one and a half degree scenario, only about two thirds of the US um, faces multiple climate threats. Um, that, that's still a big number. And so it requires a lot of work for folks to, uh, not just for birds, but for agriculture and urban centers and transportation and all the rest. But the thing that birds can do, I think, a lot of times, and do maybe better than, than most other uh, groups of animals, at least, um, is, is to kind of make it personal. That is one of the reasons I asked the, the question the way I did at the beginning is, have you, you feel like you've seen things at your local scale that make you think that climate is acting there? And so if we add birds into that discussion and say, well, what, what might it look like for birds where you live? Um, the science team has created a, a a visualizer, if you go on the link that, um, or you can just search by survival by degrees uh, under Audubon, um, it'll take you to a, to a sign in page. You can put in your zip code, um, hit submit, and you'll get a printout of the vulnerable birds and, and really all the birds that were analyzed for the state of North Carolina. Um, it'll list species that are highly vulnerable. You can click on the species to see their maps. You can change the scenario from a, a one and a half degree to a three degree. Uh, you can change the season from summer to winter and see if that affects the distribution or the, um, the kind of vulnerability of a species. Some species are vulnerable in one season or the other. Um, some species are vulnerable in both or stable in both. But this visualizer lets you really dig as deep as you want to dig by species or by groups of species. Um, and I would really encourage you to, to visit this and just play around with the tool. Again, you can adjust the scenarios, you can adjust the, the season, you can adjust the group of species you wanna look at. Um, so it's a, it's a great tool um, to kind of help you uh, visualize uh, what the effects of climate change might be in your neighborhood. Um, while I'm pulling this map up, Lauren, if you wanna put up our second poll question, um, this map shows the, those nine threats, if you will, um, kind of scaled against North Carolina. Um, so aggregated across North Carolina. Um, with this poll, what I was really wanting to, to get at is if you think about one of your favorite birds, right? If you, have, if you love your cardinals or you love going to the coast to see your favorite bird, brown pelican, or for me, golden wing warblers in the mountains, um, do you feel like they seem vulnerable to one of these threats? Um, do these threats seem uh, different? You know, or do, do they feel like a climate related threat to you? Um, and so think about that favorite bird. A lot of times a favorite bird, whether it's a wood thrush in a local park or, or whatever, uh, often is the trigger that motivates people to action. Um, so when, when we see those effects kind of brought to bear on, on our favorites, uh, it tends to, to make a difference. Um, okay, so pretty close to the first one, right? About 85% saying that um, their, their favorite bird does seem vulnerable. Um, and what I'd like to do is, um, is maybe answer some questions and, and um, Lauren, if, if we've got any questions that need answered right at the moment, if you would let me know. We don't have any questions yet. Okay. But often when we pause, somebody will type one in for us. Anybody have any questions at the moment? So while you're doing that, I'll just say, so what, what we wanna do is take this kind of big study and see what it looks like from a North Carolina perspective. So I'm gonna to try to give you some summaries of the groups of species that are affected the most by climate or predicted to be affected the most by climate in North Carolina, um, kind of how many of those there are and um, kind of where they're distributed a little bit. So, um, okay. All right, we've got a couple questions. Um, the first one is, what is a boreal forest? Yeah, so the boreal forest tends to be up uh, at higher, either for us, our spruce and fir forest technically is a boreal type forest. It's a conifer based forest um, that reaches its zenith really at kind of the northern tier of Canada. So all across the Canadian provinces, um, once you leave kind of the prairie grassland, um, uh, rolling prairies of, of southern Canada, 
um, especially middle and western Canada, you get into the boreal forest. This kind of spruce fir, um, cedar forests that really cover millions of acres. Um, unfortunately for the boreal forest, a lot of times right on top of tar sands and other kinds of valuable resources um, that put those forests kind of at, at risk. Um, I see the wire brown headed nuthatches at risk and what threats do you see for the golden wing warbler? I'll, I'll steal a little bit of my thunder here for the next one and tell you that for most of our songbirds anyway, kind of the same three threats tend to combine and act on our, on our um, songbirds. And that's the threats from urbanization, which we would know uh, even if we didn't consider that a climate related threat, we would know that urbanization, especially in North Carolina has a big impact on all these species. The other one that may seem a little odd though is extreme spring heat. Um, oftentimes uh, spring is an important time. Obviously birds are beginning to nest and those kinds of things. But when we look at like a brown-headed nuthatch, it's a cavity nester. If we have extreme spring heat early, like in March, April, um, we can see declines in productivity from, from the birds. We see it in Eastern bluebirds and nest boxes if it's too hot too early. Um, oftentimes we'll have less productivity, say maybe only fledging two chicks instead of four, those kinds of things. Um, the last one uh, that we see is these kind of heavy rain events. Um, if you look at data from the North Carolina Climate Center, what we see is that North Carolina really hasn't gained much in terms of precipitation. We haven't had a lot of severe droughts, although we do have this regular cycle of kind of dry and wet spells. Um, but we're getting more of our rain in these isolated events. So I live in the mountains and, um, you know, we, um, we're getting about the same amount of rainfall, but it's coming as these nine inches over one weekend instead of spread out over a two month interval. Um, so these high, high concentrated rain events have a really big impact on our open cup nesters, most of our songbirds. A lot of baby birds especially uh, suffer from hypothermia during these kind of high rain events, especially in spring. Um, so we see a lot of nests washing out basically. Um, if we think about birds at the coast, which we'll talk about in just a second, if you add sea level rise into that, we get a lot of nest failure from inundation, you know, especially high tides, um, sunny day flooding, those kinds of events. Um, Another question from Barbara. Uh, we see bird movements, we see bird movement moving north, but what about elevation? And yes, the, the models do predict, especially in our mountains where we have, you know, sometimes as much as 5,000 feet of elevation gain or change in, in kind of a single watershed, um, we do see predictions. For instance, golden wing warbler moving upslope. Um, we see, in, interestingly enough, we see some species predicted to move downslope, and we're already seeing that in a few instances. Red-breasted nuthatch, for instance, are now moving downslope um, into the low to middle 2,000 foot elevation, which they never did before. Um, so anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. Um, let's move on and, and continue to open your, uh, continue to enter your questions. We'll, we'll take a look at North Carolina specific data now and have, have some more questions. Okay, so what we wanted to do here in North Carolina was take that list of 614 or so species that were modeled, 389 of which were considered to be vulnerable to climate and its effects. Um, what we found was that of birds that breed or nest here, winter here, or pass through, about 204 of those 389 make significant use of North Carolina, either as, a, as I say, as a nesting, wintering, or stopover site. Um, I want to, to tell you one thing about the, the slides you'll see here on the North Carolina species. The, the rough grouse that you see here, the label for that down at the bottom uh, that's in blue, that means that if we can hold um, climate a temperature change scenario from, from one and a half degrees to three, if we can hold at one and a half, this bird does remarkably better at one and a half than it would do at three, okay? So when, when you see the labels for these species, if it's orange, that means it's vulnerable to climate change and taking pretty big hits, even at one and a half degrees. Um, if it's blue, that means we can make significant uh, improvements to the bird's prospects by holding at one and a half. 
So of the breeding species in North Carolina, and we kind of broke it out into breeding, wintering, and passage migrants, um, of the breeding species of the 204 total, about 85 of those are breeding species. Um, a majority of those, or about two thirds, are forest birds. Both high elevation forests in the western part of the state to bottomland forests in the eastern part of the state, to everything in between. And again, most share these same major climate related threats of urbanization, especially in the Piedmont, extreme spring heat, um, especially in the Piedmont, um, and heavy rain events, which covers the whole state, actually. Um, here's just a graph of some of the other species. So forest birds make up about two thirds, host and marsh water birds in blue, urban or generalist species, about 12% of the total uh, of 85 are, are these kind of urban generalist species. And this would be things like American goldfinch or brown thrasher or some of the other species that we encounter regularly in our more developed parts of the state. And then grassland birds uh, making up another small percentage. One of the especially troubling things uh, for us in the, the breeding vulnerable species is that a, a fairly good chunk of them are found in Western North Carolina only as breeders. Um, so almost a third of the, of the climate vulnerable nesters in the state are limited to the mountains. So things like red-breasted nuthatch, um, species like northern saw-wet owl, which already start out at really low population levels, maybe less than a, 100 pairs of nesting saw-wets, um, limited mostly to the spruce and fir zone in our state. Um, birds like yellow-bellied sapsucker uh, that nest in western North Carolina and then spread into the rest of the state for winter. Um, and from up north uh, in, and join us for the winter. You can see here a good example. Northern sawwets are, are not predicted to do very well at all under both scenarios, mostly because we're already seeing shifts in distribution um, of birds to a little bit higher elevations uh, in advance of, of warming. Um, and also habitat change kind of associated with that. We'll talk about some of the other threats that are, that are driving some of these declines. Um, but sapsuckers are one we can, we can help by holding at one and a half degrees. Uh, a few other mountain specialists like magnolia warbler, really, really rare breeder for us again in the spruce and fir, especially in, in kind of tamarack bogs as they're called, these kind of conifer dominated wetlands. Uh, golden wing warbler, I just always have to have a picture of golden wing and everything I do since I've studied this bird so much. And he's like the prettiest bird ever. So. Um, but also birds that birders flock to the mountains to see like black burning and black throated blues, all are significantly vulnerable to climate effects. But not just those high elevation things, right? So brown headed nuthatch is um, expected to lose a lot of territory uh, in, in North Carolina at the three degree, but can do a lot better at one and a half. But gray cat bird, as I said, brown thrasher, Eastern towhee, American goldfinch, a lot of those species. Uh, grassland birds in particular uh, for North Carolina, we don't have a lot of grassland obligates, but most of the ones we do have are vulnerable to climate change, like Eastern Meadowlark and the few breeding colonies we have in the mountains for bobolink are especially vulnerable. And then a few uh, coastal species, mostly from sea level rise, right? So least turn, Virginia rail, uh, a number of species are predicted to do uh, poorly. Least turn in particular, just from a natural habitat perspective is, is highly vulnerable. Fortunately for this species, they've adapted to rooftops and nest on the Outer Banks Mall and other places that kind of get them out of harm's way in terms of sea level rise, but, um, but still vulnerable from a climate perspective. We have a lot of um, either hypothermia or overheating uh, of our colonial nesting water birds, depending on temperature and rainfall. Um, so moving on to the non-breeding species, uh, a few more of those, um, um, but again, similarly with the breeders, about 83 or so uh, winter with us, and then there's a few more passage migrants. So think of classic um, wintering species for us like purple finch, but also a lot of our water birds and coastal birds uh, winter with us. If we throw in uh, things like waterfowl, uh, wintering ducks and geese, um, but you can see here uh, we retain some wintering forest birds, um, Again, a few grassland birds, and then some of the Arctic species, mostly shorebirds, uh, make up the bulk of the rest. Um, so if we include the wintering waterfowl, wintering and uh, passage shorebirds, all the marsh birds that just winter with us, like salt marsh sparrow, Nelson's sparrow, um, we get uh, a fair number of 
species that are vulnerable here in North Carolina. And again, the same three common threats to these species, oftentimes this affects them on their breeding grounds as well. So extreme spring heat, for instance, would affect those uh, Arctic nesters. Um, but if we add sea level rise to many of these species, that's the main driver of declines and of concern here in North Carolina. So birds like the salt marsh sparrow, um, ducks that we have just huge numbers of, but are, but are vulnerable to climate change, especially where they nest and breed in the prairie pothole regions. Um, and a lot of our shorebirds are particularly vulnerable, vulnerable especially in their Arctic um, nesting grounds. Um, but it's important for us to be able to provide them with suitable habitat and productive habitat when they're here with us, either for the winter or as a passage migrant. Most of you probably know that some of our species like red knot and others just stay with us for, for sometimes just a day or two to, to refuel as they're heading to places like Patagonia or the coast of Argentina uh, for the winter. So having these really productive stopover locations can, can make the difference between survival and not for these species. And so anything that affects the birds also affects the things they eat, right? And we're gonna talk more about that as we move into the final section, but um, you know, just keep in mind that oftentimes birds are, are fairly resilient to temperature extremes, that kind of stuff as adults, but it can be especially stressful for their young. It can be especially stressful on their prey items. Um, and so we, we have to kind of make sure we're um, continuing to protect the health of the system. Again, North Carolina is home to just amazing numbers of wintering waterfowl. And a number of these are climate vulnerable and, and make up some of the backbone of our kind of ecotourism industry in North Carolina. Um, tundra swans, 80,000 snow geese at Pocosin Lakes bring birders from all over the US and the world to come see um, these birds. And, and so doing what we can to keep them here and, and working hard to stay at the one and a half degree can make a difference for most snow geese in particular are taking it hard and already are taking it hard because of um, warming in the Arctic where they breed up on the tundra. Um, again, for the pa pure passage migrants, think something like um, Cape May warbler, um, they're kind of evenly split between marsh birds and forest birds and then small numbers of the, of the others. I'll just to throw up a, a few here. Um, things like some of our shorebirds that just are passage migrants, um, solitary sandpiper or red knot or others. Um, but also things like Cape Mays, Lincoln Sparrows, a few others that, that pass through our state uh, depend on our critical habitats for, for their migratory season. So that kind of summarizes North Carolina. I, I wanna go through these quick takeaways and then we'll pause for some more questions and another poll question. But looking at the national study and drilling that down to North Carolina, and again, there's more information on the specifics, uh, the percentage of changes, all those things embedded in the maps and some of the publications that we have available on our websites. Um, but I wanna give you kind of the, the top line messages. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about what you can do um, for the birds. The, the first one is that, you know, two, two thirds of North American birds are at, a, at an increased ri risk of extinction and severe decline uh, if we allow the climate change scenario to kind of go up to that three or even four degree um, scenario. The good news is that if we hold the line at one and a half, that improves the chances for three fourths of those same species. So, so really working hard to, to, to hold that down makes a big difference for these guys. And the other thing is that, you know, it's, it's one thing to talk about the climate space that a bird occupies, but to think about those threats um, that are associated with climate change. And, and a lot of those have direct impacts on birds and their productivity. Um, but if we're at three degrees, 304 bird species face three or more of those threats simultaneously. If we hold it one and a half, only 34 bird species um, face three or more at the same time from, from this modeling exercise. We know that some of those threats like urbanization don't go away even in the face of, of reduced climate effects. The fourth one is that every bird species that was modeled experiences some kind of impact from, from the model climate change. Now for some species, 
um, it may be positive. You may see range expansions, um, for instance. Um, but for most species, it's either neutral or harmful. There's very few species that, that benefit from, from climate change. And the fifth thing, which I'll take a pause after this slide, is, you know, we, we kind of already know what we need to do, and that's protect the places where birds are and where we think they'll be uh, needed habitat in the future based on these threat assessments and the climate um, address, if you will, of the, of the birds. And we need, to, we need to do all we can do in those spaces right now. And, and a lot of that is personal action, which we're gonna talk about next. Um, but in addition to taking those kind of personal actions, we, we also have to urge action at the state and federal levels um, and really continental levels to, to address the root causes and to hold us at that one and a half degree. Um, and those things don't happen in a vacuum. It really does take personal action um, kind of rolled up collectively um, to have those impacts and to really tell folks that we're concerned and that we think there's solutions and we'd like to work toward those solutions. And we'll talk about what a few of those are um, here next. Um, if you wanna, uh, I'll stop here and take a few questions, but also we've got one other poll that we want to do. And so Lauren, if you can throw our poll up here. And, and this really goes to this notion of hope, right? I mean, how many of you feel like you can personally do some things in your community, in your yard that, that can help reduce threats to birds and habitats and all that from climate change? I think sometimes, you know, climate makes, the whole discussion around climate change makes us feel like there's not a whole lot we can do, right? We see these big natu natural oscillations and we see the, the speed at which things are happening due to some of the things we're doing on the planet. Um, and sometimes it feels like, mm, what, what can we do about that? But I, I really wanna spend the rest of our time here talking specifically about what you can personally do um, to benefit birds and, and kind of why, like how, how does climate and changes in climate uh, impact birds. So it looks like we're, we're good, yep. So about 88%, so we're hovering around that 90% or so. And that's good. I mean, I think people need to have some sense that they can, that they can reduce some of these threats. Um, let me switch over here to look at the, stop this, look at some of the Q&A. Um, Okay, so we've got a, a question here. What's the difference between breeding and non-breeding species? So a breeding species is a bird that, that nests here in North Carolina. So they're gonna, they're gonna build a nest or make a scrape and for some of our coastal species, lay some eggs and try to make some babies. Um, so that's the main difference. Um, we oftentimes will have birds that occur in the summer, for instance, that are vagrant or they're not breeding or whatever, but the real test of that distinction is whether or not they lay eggs and, and try to have baby birds. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more in detail about particular plant species, and we have a ton of resources on our website, as does the Botanical Garden, on the use of native plants and why that's important. I'm going to talk about that in some more detail in just a minute. Um, and yes, yeah, so the question, are ornithologists and botanists working together to ensure secure habitats with adequate food and shelter? And, and again, I think the native plant work is critically important, but also some of the work that... Um, um, plant conservation folks are doing in terms of policies like oh, whether or not DOT is planting invasive species in the right of way or whether they're um, you know really working toward using native plant material where they can, um, using native plant material to conserve water for instance or is there escaping even non-native plants but making sure that we're protecting our water resource as well. There's a number of intersections between bird conservation um, in, in the plant work as well. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that a, a, little, a little bit too. Um, so somebody asked a really great question. Is this a quiet time for birds in the triangle area? Very few visitors to our feeders, a few finches and a lonely mockingbird. And yes, we do get a lot of calls this time of year that says, um, you know, I had a lot of birds and now I don't have very many. Um, some people with feeders are covered up with things like pine siskins and American goldfinches, but not so much uh, the rest of their, their birds. Part of it is timing. You know, right now, a lot of our kind of winter residents are just arriving. Things like white-throated sparrow, ruby crown kinglet, some of these guys that just visit us for the winter. 
Um, weather has a lot to do with the, the amount of visibility for birds. You know, they, they travel kind of as these mixed flocks through the neighborhoods uh, most of the fall and winter time. If the weather gets really nasty, um, they will tend to congregate and stay parked at feeders and really good resources, you know, fruit trees, um, seed um, producing, weedy patches, stuff like that. But until they're kind of forced to do that, they're kind of dispersed right now. And they're obviously the other big piece of that detectability is that most of them aren't singing right now. And we get kind of, um, you know, uh, we're, we're used to hearing bird song <laughs> most of the year. And this is probably the least bird singing time of the year that we have. As soon as daylight length starts to increase, so even starting in January, we'll start to hear more birds singing. Uh, but as daylight is really decreasing toward the winter solstice, birds really don't sing very much. Um, and of course, we have a few species where the females have migrated away a little bit and the males are still here. Um, they're not doing as much um, singing or defending or anything like that. So it, it can, be, can be tricky um, to, to find these guys. They're, they're usually here, uh, but they're in denser habitats, um, just kind of eking out a living for the winter. And again, as the weather deteriorates, as we get colder for more sustained spells, um, you'll start to see them congregate in areas again. Um, let's see, why does early spring heat reduce productivity? So there's a couple reasons for that. Um, early spring heat also produces more of those torrential rains, which we talked about. So those two are kind of associated. Um, but early spring heat has another couple of effects on some of the prey items and some of the plant material that birds depend on. So if, if we have an early spring, for instance, and um, plant growth um, gets out ahead of, say, migrant species coming back from South and Central America, you might have bud break before they arrive. And so the insect load, like the um, uh, loopers and geometer caterpillars and stuff may have peaked. Uh, early that bud break and the birds may miss that. Uh, oftentimes those um, productivity decreases are related to the health of the female, to the mother bird. So she may not get enough calcium, for instance, or she may not get enough protein to have uh, a full clutch of eggs. So um, you start to see this reduction in, in productivity. Um, Let's see, I know they're not birds, but notice sharp decline number of bats. So yeah, there has been a lot of decline in bats. And of course the biggest driver for that for us is white nose syndrome, a fungal infection that has just decimated all of our bats that hibernate together in what are called hibernacula. So little brown bats and others have, have almost gone missing um, due to white nose syndrome. A few of our kind of bark nesting and roosting species like red bat, hoary bat uh, seem fairly stable, but anything that nests together, which tend to be these massive colonies, uh, have, have largely disappeared. Um, ha they die during the winter in, in hibernation. So that's a big issue. And you are correct that we're seeing a big decline in bats, especially here in North Carolina. Uh, how much of a threat does deer browsing pose to food and habitat? It can be a huge problem depending on where you're at. Um, the reduction of understory really affects um, ground nesting birds and also that kind of shrub, less, shrub layer nesting birds. So think gray cat bird, brown thrasher, northern mockingbird, northern cardinal, all those guys that are in that kind of, you know, up to about 10 foot zone. If the deer are over browsing, we see pretty marked reductions in bird species in those places where, where over browsing has happened. Um, let me jump on to our last few slides here just to hopefully end with a little bit of a hopeful message and also explain a little bit about how climate change affects birds directly. Um, we all know that there's a lot, of, a lot of things affecting birds that may not be climate related, right? So second home development in the mountains, for instance, or um, urbanization, suburbanization, or, or urban sprawl, all those things can, can impact birds. Invasive species, whether it's hemlock adelgid or spruce fir adelgid, um, you know, changes in habitat, whether it's clearing for urbanization or just practices, um, you know, that may not be as beneficial to birds as they could be, um, excuse me, to air pollution or human disturbance, um, not necessarily from recreation, just, just human disturbance in general, noise along roadways, whatever those are. 
those things all kind of operate whether or not we have climate change or not, right? Some of them get worse or better depending on what's happening with weather and climate. But, but climate is this kind of great magnifier of all that stuff. And the reason we say that is, is birds have, um, you know, they, they live their lives in kind of a set way. They're, they're associated with certain habitats. Most of our songbirds have high sight fidelity, meaning they come back to the same places. Uh, even the birds that migrate thousands of miles away come back to the same yards and gardens and forests uh, as they were last year, especially if they were successful last year. What that can do in, in an area where you have a lot of change, whether from climate change or other things, is you get these reductions in productivity. And I, I want to show a, a couple of slides to illustrate this. So this is the, the, the outputs from the survival by degrees for red-headed woodpecker. All that red is habitat loss under the third, under the three degree scenario. And you see it's either lost or it's gained. There's not a lot of the yellows and greens in between, right? And people look at this sometimes and mistakenly believe that maybe the birds move, right? That the individual birds move. And typically that's not the way it happens. And so with most birds, um, climate change effects and other threats really create these sinks where you have birds that keep trying to nest successfully and their productivity rates, the number of babies they produce, goes down and stays down over time. It's almost like a death by a thousand cuts thing rather than, a, than an individual event. Most of our songbirds, because of high sight fidelity, don't, don't leave. They keep trying to be successful, but they may spend their entire lives and not replace themselves. You know, they may have too much predation or too much um, nest failure from heavy rain events or whatever it is, but they keep toughing it out. Um, what happens is that the climate space becomes more suitable, usually at the northern end of the range, you see productivity increase. And so over time, that looks like the population has shifted north and, and it has, but it's because of those success or failure of individual pairs of birds, not necessarily birds picking up and moving. Now we'll say there are species that do that. We have species that are highly nomadic and move and change and all that stuff. But for most of our songbirds, they live fairly sedentary lives, even if they migrate long distances, they come back to the same places and often stop over at the same places and winter in the same places. So all these effects have a big impact. Now, this is again, redheaded woodpecker at three degrees, but redheaded woodpecker at one and a half degrees is a pretty different scenario, right? So this is what we hope to, 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 to have success at keeping our increases down to around the one and a half percent or one and a half degree, because this is a big difference. Um, the bird is essentially stable if this scenario comes true. Um, in terms of total population. And it doesn't have to move huge chunks of, uh, of habitat up into the, the northern tier. Now there's a lot of stresses on it everywhere, but the thing that we try to encourage folks to think about is if you can do things that increase a bird's productivity, an individual bird's productivity in your yard, in your community, in your state, then you're setting that species up to persist a lot longer in the face of climate threats and gives us more time, frankly, to, to fix some of the problems that we create with climate change. Um, if we just say, well, you know, the bird's gonna disappear anyway, so I'm not gonna put up a box, I'm not gonna use native plants, I'm not gonna do all those things, um, then you really help speed that process up. Um, and so for a bird like red-headed woodpecker, we think of them as a big acorn specialist. This one's got a lot of granddaddy long legs in its beak, um, probably some crane flies in there too. Most birds have to feed baby birds insects, and so promoting the use of native plants, um, protecting your forest from invasive species, um, making sure that you have structure uh, in your yard as much as possible to support the maximum variety of insects and plants, um, help all these birds um, continue to persist. There's a lot of other things that we need to do. Um, that, that help birds. You know, birds are out there living their lives um, and, and again, trying to repeat those lives every year. So keeping them safe from predators like human commensal predators, like raccoons and possums, uh, keeping our cats indoors, um, making sure we don't have a lot of window collisions, all those things are, add up to this death by a thousand cuts, right? And some of those things are climate related and some are not, but the best thing we can do for birds right now 
is to make them as productive as possible in the face of these even larger threats. And you know, the birds do this year after year. The numbers that you see on these common species like the blue jay or Eastern Phoebe down at the bottom, this is the longevity records for these species. They can live to be 10, blue jay can live to be 15 or 17 in the wild. Even bigger birds like great horned owls can live to be 30 to 50. Um, so those birds that are in your yard are, are using your yard to live their lives and, um, and looking to you for some help, right? And, and your help makes a difference for those individual birds, which in turn um, slows down that pace of change related to climate change. Um, there's a ton of ways you can do that. So everything from learning how to manage your forest, like our forest herds workshop up in the upper right, to putting out brown-headed nuthatch boxes, planting native plants, both at home and churches and community gardens. I'm doing a lot of community science work. We have a, a new community science program. Uh, most folks are familiar with Audubon's annual Christmas counts and Great Backyard Bird Count, all those activities. But we have a climate watch community science program now that uh, most of our chapters across the state are engaged with that really are testing the assumptions of this climate change model uh, to track things like brown-headed nuthatches and white-breasted nuthatches and eastern bluebirds and orioles and others to see are they responding the way that we have predicted that they're going to be responding to climate change. So I encourage you to, to reach out to your local chapter or participate in programs at the Botanical Garden and and learn more about what we can do to, to help kind of stem this, these daily kinds of effects of climate change. And then really encourage you to get involved um, for the collective action side of things. Audubon's got a, a great group of, of folks who help us with Lobby Day. This is from two years ago. In the time of COVID, this was this year's Lobby Day. We had over 175 folks participate virtually with our legislative um, representatives this year in North Carolina. Um, you'll see some familiar faces on this slide. Um, Barbara Driscoll, I'm talking about you. Um, please get involved. Do what you can do in your yards and also help us collectivize that action. And let, let our elected leaders know that you care about this stuff. We, we may um, you know, disagree on some of the, of the methods, but I think we all agree on the outcome, which we, we want healthy plants, healthy birds, healthy communities. Um, and we can, we can work out the details, but we all have to take those first steps to, to kind of get started. Um, with that, I'm gonna, I don't have a lot of time for questions, but we'll answer questions on that last section and take any other questions that have come up. I really appreciate um, your time today, um, but let's, let's see what questions we have. Um, okay, so yeah, so uh, first question here. I live in a neighborhood that, that thankfully didn't clear cut the forest, but many of the neighbors use a mosquito control service. Um, there, there are obviously pesticide effects on beneficial insects and pollinators. Most of the mosquito control folks will tell you that they're using you know, natural and organic um, based compounds to do that. The end result is kind of the same though, in that um, you do suppress um, you know, those insects and, and some of our birds actually eat mosquitoes and others. So um, just to give you an example, a, a typical chickadee nest uh, needs about 6,000 soft bodied insects uh, per nest to get those babies out of the nest and fledged on their own. That's a lot of food. And if the forest is mostly dominated by an invasive plant that doesn't host any caterpillars or um, there's a lot of insecticide or nicotinoid based um, ornamental plantings. Uh, there's just not a lot of insect load um, and that can be hard for, for species. What we've learned through kind of deep study of a lot of declining species is that the difference, really the difference between fledging four chicks versus fledging two chicks out of a nest and fledging, I mean, they're able to leave the nest um, can often make the difference between whether or not a species is stable or declining. It doesn't sound like a big difference, but when you add up all the, all the other ways that, that populations are suppressed, meaning 50% you know, of all open cup nests fail and then a bird re-nests, um, and then about half to 80% of the fledglings, the baby birds that leave the nest are predated before they're mature enough to fly away. Um, you know, over time, that has a big impact. And so things like um, a heavy rain event that washes out a nest, maybe the last attempt for that bird for the year. Um, so anything that you can do that reduces those risks is really important. Um, so thank you for that question. It, 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 we, we obviously live in these environments as well. And so people want to be 
uh, able to enjoy those environments too. And, and I get, um, and especially here in the Triangle, I don't know why, but there's more mosquitoes here than there are on the coast. Um, so I don't know what the answer to that is other than um, you know, native, native plants and less water sitting around, but um, uh, reducing that, especially during nesting season is really important. Uh, we have a question about um, kind of policy. So besides federal and state level, it seems we could realistically bring about positive local change to our city and council governments regarding land use and building regulations. Any recommendations of good regulations, ordinance for such in North Carolina or elsewhere? Yes, absolutely. Um, there is a lot of good examples out there. And I would encourage you to visit the North Carolina Audubon website. We have a lot of local climate uh, ordinances at play. We have a lot of native plant ordinances in the works. Um, Barbara Driscoll on this call has worked with Durham and, and other communities. We've got successful ordinances in Winston-Salem, uh, New Hanover County, a, a num Charlotte, a number of places have, have made local ordinance differences that make a, make a big difference, both for climate, but also for birds. Um, again, I encourage you to visit our website, uh, nc.audubon.org, or the national website to learn more about um, all of those all those things and, and really get involved. That's that's the main take home message. Um, I know we're out of time. I see Joanna up in the corner, um, but uh, my email is here. If you have other questions, please feel free to shoot me an email. I'll I'll do my best to, to answer it. Um, and really appreciate everybody's time today. It's it's been great and uh, glad we've we've got so many people on who, who care about these things. Back to you. Joanna. Thank you, Curtis, so much. This was fantastic. I have so many notes. It's uh, really great information. And we thank the New Hope Audubon Society as well for partnering with the North Carolina Botanical Garden to offer this program. We look forward to, look, we're looking forward to partnering more on programs in 2021. So, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, just a brief note too, consider joining us next Thursday at noon for our Year of the Wildflower finale and be thinking about your own plant love stories, the topic of that talk. Join us for Lunchbox Talks again starting the fourth week of January. They'll be on the website calendar soon. For now, you can link to them directly through our registration calendar and the link should be in the chat. If you're not currently a member, we hope you'll consider joining or purchasing a membership gift for someone in your life during this holiday season. Lauren's posting all of these links in the chat. And again, thank you all for attending. We hope to see you in the garden soon.